coming up on My Week, Nolan Finley's exclusive interview with MSU President John Engler. How do we prevent this from ever happening again? How do we fix the process? Plus, he answers to victims' criticisms and talks of settlements. Also coming up, a milestone this week, Detroit no longer under state oversight and significant development projects in the works. Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson join me at the table. I'm Christy McDonald. My Week is coming up. I have a question. Who wants to go first to win? Who wants to grow our business? Who wants to make more money? Who wants more job opportunities? If you want Michigan to compete and become a top 10 state, raise your hand. Together, we've turned Michigan around and started moving forward. Now help us build a stronger Michigan than ever. Raise your hand at StrongerMichigan.com. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. We have a big show coming up for you this week where it finally feels like spring. We'll have Nolan Finley's interview with Michigan State University President John Engler, plus a big milestone for Detroit. No more state oversight. We'll debate the significance there. Some development news that could change the face of downtown. We'll get to all of that coming up. But first, say hello to our My Week contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News, Stephen Henderson of WDET Radio. Gentlemen, it's great to see you. You know, I wanted to get down to some serious headlines here, and all you guys want to talk about is the Kentucky Derby. The Derby. Right. On Derby's coming up, and it's a huge. <laughs> to be a great race. This year. What's yeah. your fascination, though, with with horse racing? Well, well I mean, I think sport. we both have roots in Kentucky of of sorts, and it's, is this where the friendship the really began? Was uh... Kentucky and <laughs> horses and bourbon? <laughs> I mean, they're beautiful creatures, and yeah. it's a, a wonderful sport, and it's quite a spectacle. I mean, yeah, the Derby. The event itself. Beautiful. And you guys, you have both been there. I have yeah. never been to the Derby. Yeah. Um, so I'll have to get myself a hat and get on go, down. You gotta go down. Like, I've, been to, I've been to two legs of the Triple Crown, the Derby, and then of course the Preakness is in Baltimore where I lived for a mm -hmm. long time. And now we're here in Michigan Several with times that. Northville closing. No horse racing of any kind in Michigan. No, it's mm -hmm. sad, but it's just it sort of the way it's going. I mean, it's, a, it's an industry that has changed and not adapted to change. So has the sport enough. grown at all in terms of bringing in new viewers and, and uh, people who are interested you know, in the sport? I think the Derby is the Derby, and it's yeah. always going to be. Be popular. What's helped horse racing in a lot of places mm. is the is casino, is their, their the quasi casino, or they're full on casinos yeah. with horse racing. So. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to uh, some of the news before we get to our big story of the, your interview with um, MSU President John Engler. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in the Democratic race for governor. You have two candidates who are going after each other and questioning the <laughs> validity of their candidacy. So Abdul Al Sayed and mm -hmm. Sri Tanandar. Uh, Tanandar says Sayed is not registered to vote for four years prior to running for governor. And Al Sayed says, well, his uh, petitions, he has some bad petitions. What do you make of all this, Stephen? Well, I mean, it's it's politics, right? Yeah. If you can eliminate your competition altogether, <laughs> why not try Canadar to do said, it? said, look, he's got 5 or 6%. I'll take that gladly. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that would really make a difference. If he got it. For Sri. I mean, Sri, who has, uh, I think, run a surprising campaign in terms of its popularity. It shows you how powerful money can be, though, uh, when you have that kind of Money matters, and, mm -hmm. and you still have, uh, I think, significant portions of the Democratic, Democratic electorate that is uh, unfamiliar with or uncomfortable with uh, Gretchen Whitmer, and they're not, they're not sold. And so the other option, uh, the other viable option in their mind seems to be somebody Somebody like Shri, uh, I, I think. And she's he, staying quiet on this. Uh, well, she's staying in, too in her quiet case, on everything. Well, in her case, though, you you, you know you let them slug it out. Uh, if one of them lo leaves, maybe you pick up some of the votes from them too. Yeah, I don't know why, why she'd you, get why, into well, it. Yeah, why would you jump into it? No. Well, but you wouldn't jump into that, and I, I'm surprised Tanandar's jumping into that. But if you look at you know, the chamber poll that was out last week. Shri Thanantar is up by a couple, three points on Gretchen Whitmer. He's had all the advertising. She's done none. It's probably time she gets in. You don't want to let that go on too long. 
uh, you don't want to let him sit in that front runner position too long because people start taking him seriously and the checks start flowing in. Yeah. And so that's when you start to see the importance of uh, how important will the Mackinac Policy Conference be? And I'm going to do a tiny plug here that the three of us are going to be moderating mm -hmm. the bipartisan debate. So we're going to have six candidates <laughs> for governor <laughs> on is, stage, three I Republicans, say, three Democrats. It's going to be a good say, time. Up front in our defense, this has never worked out all that well. We so. did it once before, didn't we? <laughs> Well, we did. We did it, it for a primary on, uh, for, D for Detroit mayor. No, for we mayor. did it for no, the governor's did primary the governor's when they had like, it was, uh, I, I can't remember. We've, we've done these. That was during the Republican. Yeah. Uh, See, but, 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 we're gonna but guys, Republican you, you don't understand the, the one thing that you were missing back then. <laughs> you. It was me, right. so I'm going to have to be the That's traffic right. cop in this yeah. whole thing. No, poor Tim Skubik did it. Oh, he did it, yeah. Eight yeah, years yeah. ago uh, at the policy conference and... Look, I have a lot of respect for Tim, but that thing was just a disaster. Well, we did 12 in the mayoral race. Yeah, right. It's, 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 hard to, it's hard to do. It's, you know, but we will work well, really hard to we'll make sure done. that people get value out of this. Well, we'll we're going to have to set up the, the, the parameters. We'll have that. All right, well, turning now to our big story, an in-depth look at what is going on at Michigan State University. Nolan ended up getting a sit-down interview with MSU President John Engler a few days ago. Nolan, give me a sense of um, how much time you spent with him and how you found him um, and, and kind of what your, the, the tone of your conversation was like. It was about an hour and a half total with uh, with the governor, and you know he was very focused on on mission. You know he wanted to talk about about the procedures and policies that he's put in place and is putting in place. You know I ask him what he found when he walked in the door, and to me the most significant part of the interview was that that answer when he said, you know there was no structure here, nobody was in charge here. Um, it was very diffuse, very disorganized. Nobody was responsible for anything. And he said, you can see how this situation was allowed then to fester because nobody was watching anyone. He expressed great frustration with the university processes like tenure. You know, he was like, well, why can't we fire that guy? You've got a guy tra charged with all of these counts of, of criminal sexual contact. Why can't we fire him? And he, you know, I, I think he's a bit frustrated by the limitations uh, a university structure puts on reform. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the interview mm -hmm. and then we'll come on out and uh, we'll discuss what he had to say. Go ahead, take a look. John Engler, you're here at MSU, Michigan State University as interim president, brought in to fix a real mess here and deal with a real crisis. How do you define your mission? Well, I think I've got two jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I came here first, they said yes. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife, Michelle and I talked this over. I love the university. And if I could help, and I happened to be available, I'd retired from the round table. Mm -hmm. And I came here, and after talking to the trustees, there's two, two main jobs. One is obviously to respect uh, the pain and the suffering that survivors have incurred. I mean, the, mm -hmm. this has been tough. It happened over a lot of years, a lot of damage done. So, you know, try to help them. They're all suing the Michigan State, so we've got to work through those lawsuits. But at the same time, the other thing that they're saying, and they've said this in the courtroom, day after day, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? How do we fix the process? And, and so I've spent a lot of time doing that. I actually, we've got you know this document about a safer campus. Mm -hmm. So make the campus safer, make sure this can't happen again. And then at the same time, get this ready for a process to select a new president who can be here for the next decade. So you don't expect to be here forever. How long would you expect to be here, John? I'll, I'll go tomorrow if we get a new president. But you know, realistically, not, where do you Realistically, it's probably past the first of the year. I okay. think if the search process can get started later in 2018, maybe it can mm -hmm. be wrapped up in either the end of the year, more likely, I suppose, sometime after the first of the year. So then. what have you done? What's in, in this document in uh, terms of policies? Three main categories, Nolan. Mm -hmm. we've, we've been dealing with patient care and safety. Nasser mm -hmm. was a physician. He abused these young women and girls a, as a doctor. So the, the idea of having consent, that's really understanding what is that procedure, making sure there's chaperones. While many, many of these young women had their parents in the room, the procedures clearly weren't adequate because they didn't understand the abuse that was occurring in front of their very eyes. We have to fix that. We also need better records to be kept. Nasser didn't bill for a lot of the stuff that he did, and so there wasn't a record of it. He did a lot of this away from MSU. He went out of state. He went to Olympic camps, mm -hmm. and, and we ought to know what he's doing out there. And the groups that he's volunteering for, 
need to have an obligation to tell us if he steps over the line. The Olympic Committee, when they knew he was an abuser well before Michigan State was informed, didn't tell us. What did you find when you arrived here in terms of organization, structure, culture, and how did all of that play into enabling the Nasser scandal and abuse to continue? Well, I think there were weak systems, just as I mentioned. I mean, the idea mm -hmm. that a doctor can provide treatment and it doesn't show up in the record anywhere. Mm -hmm. That we had, a, in, in the case of one dean, a, a pretty no, a lot of notoriety for Dr. William Scramble. Scramble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when I got here and took a look at his lack of professionalism, his mm -hmm. poor leadership as a dean, I said, we've got to revoke his tenure. He should never be in the university again. Mm -hmm. And so we started that process. Process takes too long but we got it started right away. And then when the Attorney General investigation found other evidence of things that were not able to be known, we didn't have access mm -hmm. to his computer, we didn't know what he had, these home files. When, when they saw that, boy, it just affirmed that we were right to move. And um, we've said anybody in any of these investigations, you show up to be a bad actor, you're out. But that's also the true, if we find somebody who's not in an investigation, but we get a complaint today, and we've had complaints, we're going to act on those people. But you found disorganization in the systems, in the processes, when you arrived here. Yeah, I thought they were weak. I thought they were inadequate. There wasn't enough communication, and we're mm -hmm. fixing that. And sometimes one agency at the university wasn't telling the other agency mm -hmm. what they were doing. We're trying to open those lines of communications. We've even built um, interlocal agreements. Some of this stuff was done before I got here. We're just trying to now check it and double check it and scrub everything. We want to make sure that when we're done, Michigan State's going to emerge stronger because we will have vetted every single process. This mm -hmm. report deals with patient care and safety, prevention of sexual misconduct and sexual assault, and then response if prevention fails, if there is misconduct or sexual assault, how do we respond to it? So we've got seven pages now. This will grow over time as mm -hmm. we take more actions. And what we say to people, if there's something you think we're missing, tell us because we're committed. We think that when we're done, there'll nobody be holding the candle to us in terms of what we have in place. Then it's also dependent on the leaders to make it work. Is there a culture, did you find a culture here that downplayed sexual assault, sexual abuse? Were they insensitive to what was happening to girls on this campus? I think that Michigan State probably wasn't a lot different than other universities or mm -hmm. what we saw in the entertainment industry or yeah. uh, with Weinstein or what we saw in the news industry with Lauer. Mm -hmm. There's all these problems in society. I think we're very much part of society. In that case, unfortunately, we're reflective. What I would like to see is a Michigan State that's hypersensitive and says, look, you misbehave, you're gone. You mm -hmm. can't be with our students. But I want a parent to know when their child comes here, they're coming to a safe environment. So we, we were not doing as well as we should. We, we look at how we compare other universities and probably better than some, worse than others. You took a lot of criticism based on a meeting you had with one of the victims uh, who came to your office and said you offered her $250,000 or asked her if she would take a $250,000 settlement. What happened in that meeting? Well, that meeting was one that I, and I've had many meetings with people who've been mm -hmm. victims of Nasser's crimes, with talk uh -huh. to their parents. This young woman chose to offer a version. Just our memories are different than hers. That's all I've said. I don't talk about those meetings. we got a young woman who suffered a lot. We, we understand that, and that's traumatizing, and I think she's still trying to work through all of that. And just how she remembered this meeting was very different than those of us who were there. So you've been criticized for not being empathetic enough. Are you sympathetic to what's happening What's happened to these girls at the hands of, of Larry Nass? Well, I wouldn't take this job if I weren't. You, mm -hmm. you can't do this work and not mm -hmm. be sympathetic. And, and you've got to appreciate, these, these were, many of these were very young girls when this abuse happened. Uh, and some of them, as they've said, didn't know it for years that they actually were being abused. And so they're dealing with this. And we want to help them get through that. And we also want to make sure that our campus environment doesn't allow this to happen again, either to somebody who's a patient or somebody who's a student here. Now, there is an expectation. There's 306 lawsuits, I believe. That's the current number. There's an expectation this is going to be very expensive for MSU. How will the university pay for these settlements, and is the, the financial viability of Michigan State at risk? Well, uh, I certainly hope not, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you're right that it's probably going to be expensive and painful. Mm -hmm. uh, I've minced no words about that, uh, even when people haven't really wanted to hear that. I said, no, you, you better understand 
This is, this is serious. The, the settlement process is now being overseen by a federal judge. Very confidential process, uh, gag orders in place, but we do know that we start again in May. And, and I think it's really important. We don't want uh, people who have been victimized by NASA to end up being victimized by a trial court system yeah. which runs four or five years. Right. We want to get settlements so they can move on. And the university needs to move on as well, but move on in a different, with a different attitude and, and, a, and a different approach because yeah. we're, we're now out there in America as a university's had to deal with this. Uh -huh. and this is very different, but it, and it, it's coincided with the Me Too movement in the country. Mm -hmm. So it gives us an opportunity to emerge, as I said, much stronger and really be a leader. John Ingram, thank you. Appreciate thank you. your time. It's a good interview, Nolan. I Thank noticed you. he did um, skirt around the issue of how is mm -hmm. Michigan State going to mm -hmm. pay for it. Um, Stephen, I'm going to go to you first, and get, what is your reaction to what you saw with Nolan says? So, I mean, I think what he's saying there about changing the structures, uh, having come in and found very little structure for dealing with this kind of thing makes a, a total sense and is, is the kind of thing that plays to John Engler's strengths, right? The, mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things he was very good at. Uh, my concern continues to be that this is an academic institution, one, uh, and that it needs an academic leader, uh, and that there isn't one, and that the faculty has expressed no confidence in John Engler to be that academic leader. And then uh, uh, the other question is the cultural change that needs to take place at, at uh, Michigan State University, and whether Engler, who is a politician uh, by his DNA uh, is mm -hmm. the right person to change that culture. Yeah, and you sat down with him. This was a, a couple of days ago, and yeah, so it was right. before actually. Um, so the second phase of their independent review of their Title IX program came out yesterday, mm -hmm. and one of the quotes from the report was they were concerned that MSU still struggles to communicate effectively and consistently about its values and its goals, mm -hmm. and that this weakness may irreparably undermine the university's Title IX related progress. And, and he did touch upon that a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of the communication and the the fact that not everyone was on the same page of where the university needs oh, to oh be. Oh yeah, I mean he, th he thought communication was one of their big weaknesses and, and that's part of the process here. Um, to Steve's point, he doesn't want to be the academic leader. I mean he's got a specific job. He, want, he said his job is to get this place ready to pick a president, right. one, to have an, an orderly process for picking a president because he recognizes the way in which he was appointed created a, a good deal of consternation and chaos. But he doesn't want to be the academic leader. He wants out of there by the end of the year or shortly after. Uh, but these process, the, the idea of these policies they're putting in place and these expectations and standards they're laying out. He talked about dealing with kids first day, second week, right. first month throughout in terms of their orientation to campus for the first year, setting expectations. You could, this is okay, this isn't okay. And he talked about even going, particularly with the kids they recruit for the athletic pro programs, dealing with them in high school mm -hmm. to try to establish uh, yeah. better behavior. Yeah. Um, you know, something that you asked him about, which I was glad you did, two things, about his, the perception of his sympathy mm -hmm. towards the victims and then also the, the, um, the different perceptions that he had and one of the victims had about a meeting that they had mm -hmm. about a potential settlement. Um, what did you think of his response on that? Because that was something that people wanted to hear. Yeah, well, I mean, so I'm less concerned about his sympathy, I guess, uh, personally, than I am his ability to affect the cultural change that would make the entire university not just more sympathetic, uh, but but more responsible and accountable uh, for these things. And I guess that's where my concern is. I don't think as a person he's unsympathetic mm -hmm. to these people, but I think that uh, the way he approaches problems uh, and the way he solves problems uh, comes across as unsympathetic. And that meeting, that woman's recollection of that meeting, I think if you know John Engler and have watched him for a very long time, you can see very clearly the path that in his mind would have led him to that kind of uh, bartering or negotiation over something like this. Uh, and, and that's, it's not just unsympathetic, uh, it's disrespectful to, again, the cultural problem that created this. In my longer interview with him, uh, you know, he talked about 
uh, he acknowledged the fact that he comes across perhaps uh, as uh, not as sympathetic and and you know he talked maker. about what he was. you know not being used to the rhythm of a university mm -hmm. which moves much slower and he's coming in and saying we're going to fix that we're going to change that we're going to change that and at a university the the expectation is everybody gets in you know and everybody has a vo has a voice and it's a longer process mm -hmm. uh, than you're 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 dealing with in almost any organization and he talked about how he recognized that could come across as sort of a bull in a china shop. Yeah. But. All right. Well, you know, you can read uh, Nolan's interview with mm. Detroit News and also uh, you can see it back at myweek.org. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for that, Nolan. All right, let's move on. A landmark week for the city of Detroit. The city is no longer under state financial oversight almost five years ago after filing for bankruptcy. Also this week, some big news about a potential Ford campus in Corktown, plus new developments by the Illiches to go along with Little Caesars Arena and a waterfront aquarium from the <laughs> Detroit Zoo. All right, so let's start, though, with the significance of Detroit being out from under state oversight. This is a big deal. So no Justice Department oversight, yeah. um, no Housing Department oversight, right, and yeah. state financial review now stepping back. Detroit, you're on your own. Here's your second chance. Right. I mean, well, first of all, let's talk about the, the remarkable uh, set of circumstances that had to happen to create this. Three straight years of balanced budgets. They turned out to be three, th three straight years of surplus uh, budgets. Think back in time in Detroit. When was the last time we had one year of surplus budget? I mean, you talk about the difference uh, there over time. You know, one of the things that, that is disappointing when, this, when these kind of things happen is that we get caught back in the narrative that, uh, about the bankruptcy and whether it was necessary or good for the city. And, you know, a bunch of stuff gets loaded onto bankruptcy that was never part of the intent of bankruptcy. Bankruptcy was not going to fix uh, the, the tremendous social ills that we have in, in Detroit. The bankruptcy was not going to fix uh, the lack of opportunity that exists in so much of Detroit. Mm -hmm. Bankruptcy is a very simple process. It's about reorganizing your debt in a way that allows you to service it and take some of the money that you have and spend it on services. It did that tremendously. $7 billion swing in our debt picture. Uh, there is more money to hire more police officers, firefighters, uh, garbage pickup, those kind of things. It gives us the opportunity to get to these other things because the debt is not on our back. We're just at the beginning of that. It's too early to say, well, we haven't solved all these other problems. Yeah. Now we have the opportunity to focus on that. Because you have the resources to be able to do it. But and, it and I think it, when, you, mm -hmm. when you look at it, do other cities or other municipalities in the country say, wow, Detroit did it right, or they did it the right I'm way? I'm surprised that more municipalities haven't followed the path. Because remember, Detroit was the, the first and largest municipality to go in bankruptcy. And the fear was it was going to trigger a wave of such bankruptcies around the country. But if you look at this, Detroit now has a, a basically debt-free city or a much, much reduced, much reduced debt-free yeah. city. And in the school district, the debt was wiped away. The challenge now Some for way, both yeah. um, the city and the school district is to be very, very careful with the credit card. Uh, you know, they don't want to start borrowing again. Yeah. Uh, you've got to live within the but means. The other, I think the city's doing that. But the other s signal is to the state in particular about its investment in mm -hmm. cities like Detroit, which has been abysmal for the last 20 years, uh, really awful, and wasn't great before that. I mean, cities around the, the cities around the still, right, all over, all over Michigan, there are still really tremendous uh, gaps in terms of uh, the things that we need uh, here in the city of Detroit and the money that we have to provide them. Uh, bankruptcy put us in a position where we have, uh, we got the debt off our backs, but it doesn't necessarily solve that problem uh, of revenue. And I, I continue to believe that we need to revisit the whole idea of the way we provide revenue for cities, both from the tax side of things, uh, which nobody wants to talk about, and from the revenue sharing side of things, you know, what what taxes are collected at the state level that need to be returned to cities. But coming, but coming out of oversight this week, let me interrupt, Nolan, mm -hmm. um, does this signal to businesses either, either in Michigan or outside of Michigan saying Detroit is the place to invest now and you have all these announcements 
announcements this week of more building coming We've in the villages. That, right? and everything. We've been yeah. seeing that. I mean, it, if, if you if you look across the landscape of Detroit, it's remarkable about what's happening. There's new places, new things going into the ground, different things. You actually have factories now going into the ground. It's not all bars, restaurants, and what do you, What do you make of Ford thinking of moving a campus down I, to Corktown? You know, mm. I think that is, is a huge thing, not just for Corktown, for the whole city. And to Steve's earlier point in terms of revenue, I don't think you can count on the state revenue solving Detroit's problems, but there is a lot of opportunity to grow Detroit's own tax base. And if this development grows Detroit's tax base, you get more workers in here paying uh, income taxes, more property taxes. I think more that's where the, pro where the resources for solving well, the problems problem, got to come from. Some of yeah. the problem on it's the development the side is, is that uh, we give away the tax revenue mm -hmm. on, the, on the development side. Look at the stadiums, right? We collect almost nothing uh, in taxes from these huge investments but that we we've do made from the people who of tax there. dollars. Yeah. Uh, we, we've got to rethink the way we fund cities uh, in a big picture way in this, in this, uh, in this state, and, and Detroit will not be able to fix its problems until until we do that. Well, I'm going to be interested to see some of the news coming out of the uh, the Ford uh, shareholders meetings in the next couple of weeks of what's yeah. going to be happening down in Corktown. That'll be really good. All right, that's going to do it for my week. We are on Facebook and Twitter during the week. Check us out for some behind-the-scenes work that we're doing. Plus, for any shows you might have missed, check out myweek.org. I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you next time. Take care. I have a question. Who wants to go first to win? Who wants to grow our business? Who wants to make more money? Who wants more job opportunities? If you want Michigan to compete and become a top 10 state, raise your hand. Together, we've turned Michigan around and started moving forward. Now help us build a stronger Michigan than ever. Raise your hand at StrongerMichigan.com. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929.